I usually give about uh, between 20 and 30 major speeches a year. And uh, that pace was maintained during January and February of this year. But then in March came coronavirus, April, May, June, uh, I, not a single one. Many, many Zoom presentations, but not a single live audience speech. Now, when I step out onto the stage or up to the podium for a live audience speech, it's almost impossible to see individuals or even think individuals. Essentially, you are confronting a large amorphous audience and the speaking style and the oratory that is involved is specifically for a large audience. But when I welcome you to the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show, it's a totally different deal. It's not me looking out and thinking of thousands of people out there. No, I am speaking only to you. Now, obviously, there are a number of people, each on their own schedule, their own time, they're going to be listening. But I see only one happy warrior with a huge and humble heart. And I may not know your name, although I do know the names of many listeners already. But I do know enough about you to know that if you have listened more than once, if you've come back for more, then you are a happy warrior. Because only happy warriors with huge and humble hearts are capable of absorbing some of the toughness that gets delivered on this show. Because you'll remember... Listeners to this show are not tennis balls floating down the gutter of life. Listeners to this show are not supine and lethargic lumps of passive protoplasm just waiting to be massaged with warm butter. No, listeners to this show are happy warriors with huge and humble hearts. Listeners to this show are eager to be actors on the stage of life, not merely to be acted upon. And so I do have a pretty good idea of who you are when I say, welcome to the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show, where your rabbi reveals how the world really works. That's right. And one way the world really works is that it's very difficult to know what any single individual person is likely to do under certain circumstances or given a set of specific stimuli. But the bigger the group of people is, the easier it becomes to know how it's going to evolve and what it's going to do and how it's going to react to certain circumstances. Until you reach the size of an entire nation or a society or a country, and it then becomes largely predictable, which is a rather amazing thing to think about. And what is so particularly interesting is that if you actually look at the periods of a society, and now there are places, of course, where several societies have existed sequentially. Uh, India, the Indian subcontinent, has had uh, oh, about 50, in, in recorded history, about 50 different dynasties. Uh, China, uh, I think about 10 or 20 of them. Uh, the, the German areas, also many. But you can, by and large, identify a number of, if you like, empires or social groups of large numbers of people. You know, for instance, the, the British Empire, uh, which is a pretty definable thing. Now, no empire begins on a certain date and ends on a certain date. Um, it, it sort of comes into being through a a burst of exciting, um, outgoing creativity and establishment and hardship and bravery and initiative. And, and then this sort of thing happens. 
Uh, you know, think of the British Empire. It's really okay to think of it as having started in about 1700 and ended in the aftermath of World War II, probably 1950. But it's fairly safe to say that that was its period. There really wasn't anything to speak of in terms of a British Empire before 1700, because the British Empire was largely built uh, with the ships and the Royal Navy, and it was only about 1700 that uh, the, the British dominance of the oceans began. Uh, it started winding down already during World War II. By 1950, it was done. At any rate, the point is that it was 250 years. That's how long it was. Uh, the the Russian Empire under the Romanovs, again, 1682. And I, I don't want to take the time to sort of unfold why I say 1682. But again, if you, if you regard the beginning of an empire not as any specific date, but as picking a date in the middle of a period of unprecedented expansion, and uh, and and excitement and and things moving and growing and expanding. Then 1682, and of course it ended with the communist revolution in 1916. That's 234 years. Um, Spain, the Spanish Empire, again interesting, right? Today, Spanish is spoken in Mexico. It's spoken in Cuba only because there was once a Spanish Empire that extended you know, really from Spain all the way across to South America, through the Caribbean, even into North America. So that period, 1500 to 1750, 250 years. And, you know, you can go through this exercise yourself, depending on how interested you are. I'm very interested. But it's really, it's not hard to find a date which is sort of in the middle of that growth period. And then, of course, a date where it's pretty much wound down and non-existent. Yeah, yeah, that's that's possible as well. Um, think of uh, think of the Roman Empire. Also pretty amazing. OK, first of all, there was the Roman Republic, which was B.C. So um, 260 to 27. So that's about uh, 233 years. Then the Roman Empire, as we know when we speak of the Roman Empire, 27 BC, right, starting when the Roman Republic ended, all the way up to about 180 AD, and that's uh, 207 years. You could go a little bit later than that, maybe, if you want, just a little bit. But again, you know, you think about what an empire meant. It meant that, um, you know, it extended from Rome to Egypt, excuse me, from 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 England to Egypt. So the Romans could have had an, uh, an official, and this is what's so fascinating, and uh, I, uh, I got this from the writing of a fascinating British general, a guy called General John Glubb. I know his name sounds as if he's sort of almost a cartoon character, but he's not. Um, he uh, was born in the eight, late 1800s, and he died nearly 90 years old in the 1980s. So he, he was a very interesting guy. He led the Jordanian army against Israel in 1948, when the state of Israel was coming into existence. Um, General John Glubb was uh, head of the, of the uh, Jordanian army. And in, in itself, how he got there was fascinating. He fought heroically in World War I. But then he, he moved over to the Jordanians, and he really built up the Jordanian army to what was, at a, for a period, the best uh, Arab army in the region. And um, General John Glubb, uh, then in the 1950s, King Hussein was trying to sort of show that he's not a Western lackey and that he's his own Arab. And so he, he got rid of all the English and American people that had built up his, his country, and including among them, he just got rid of the General Glubb, sent him back to England where he was retired. But but he was a guy who really did some very, very interesting things. And uh, anyway, he pointed out to me that um, a Roman official based in England could be transferred to Egypt. And so he'd have to travel from England to Egypt. He might have crossed the channel 
uh, to what is now France or Belgium, and then he would have made his way down through France and Italy, and uh, and then um, uh, through uh, Croatia, and then taken a ship down to Egypt, maybe, or else he could have gone through Palestine. But the bottom line that's so fascinating to think of is that during that entire journey of nearly 3,000 miles, this Roman Empire official would have never been outside he, the common land, everywhere he went, they'd speak his language. The currency was the same everywhere he went. That was what an empire meant. It was pretty amazing. You know, that, that, that's what it was. And again, you know, 230 years along, um, you can go back to the Assyrian Empire. We don't know a whole lot about it, but we do know that it began in about 80, 860 BC and ended about... Um, 615 or thereabouts. So again, about 250 years. Uh, the Greek Empire, again, you know, stretched and they sp- Greek and currency and culture and language spread throughout. And, uh, and that was uh, 230 years. Um, the Mameluke Empire. Now, again, if you've, if you've visited Israel and you had a good guide, particularly in the Jerusalem area, then you would have learned who the Mamelukes were. But they were the Arabs that preceded the Ottomans. And it was quite an effective empire, 267 years. Um, then came the Ottoman Empire. Ottoman Empire was from 1320, and uh, it pretty much ended 1570. I think I've told you in the past about the Battle of Lapanta how the Christian navies of Europe um, finally demolished the sea dominance of the Ottomans. So again, the Ottoman Empire was 250 years exactly. Um, So it goes, you know. And so what's interesting to me is that the, um, well, back in 1920, during Germany's Weimar period, a very corrupt, decadent period of Germany, um, there was a, a journalist, a cultural critic, I forget, M- 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 Mueller, Mueller, I think was his name, and um, he wrote essentially saying that what Germany needs is a Third Reich. And, um, you know, it's not that people sort of spoke about the German First Reich and then the Second Reich, you know, th- these were not really terms. He coined that term, the Third Reich. Now, funnily enough, uh, it was about 10 years later that Hitler was writing the book Mein Kampf, which I do recommend. And um, Hitler in Mein Kampf, interestingly enough, never uses the phrase Mein Kampf. Excuse me, never uses the phrase Third Reich. But by the time they took power, in uh, 1932, 1933, by the time the Nazis uh, were voted into power and Hitler became the uh, Reich's chancellor, the chancellor of the Reich, uh, he was frequently speaking about the Third Reich and most famously said the Third Reich will last for a thousand years. Well, I mean, in actuality, it, it lasted for 12 years, to be exact. But what puzzles me a little bit is I've never found any record that says that sort of people questioned that or burst out laughing. I guess they didn't want to get to a concentration camp. But the point I'm making is I give you the list of all these different empires through world history, you know, from from a thousand years BC to uh, the present time, you'll notice that they all seem to function for somewhere between 220 and 260 years. That seems to be the, um, uh, the, the, the duration. So when Hitler spoke about the Thousand Year Reich, you really would have thought that somebody would have said, excuse me, you know, that's, that doesn't happen. Somehow or another, when large groups of people form societies or nations or epochs, uh, what 
seems to be predictable is that they go through a period of rising and falling that seems to take about 250 years. So your talk of a thousand-year Reich is nonsensical. It's, it's never happened in world history. And sure enough, indeed, it, it has not. And here's the interesting thing. Uh, just a few days ago, we celebrated the 4th of July, American Independence Day. And it was something, a little bit of a subdued day, I think, only because people look at the demolished statues. And everybody knows that a people that forgets its past imperils its future. And I think many of us viewed with considerable misgiving the long-term implications of the kind of, um, well, what appears to be a cultural collapse in America. So 244 years America has existed, and every single empire, epoch, every single society seems to last about between 220, 230 years and 260 years. So, you know, maybe 250. Many of them are exactly on, or as I counted, 250. So what does this mean? We're six years away? Well, again, there's no date, but uh, it does bear looking at because there is a fascinating biblical dimension. Uh, For one thing, let's also note that the Babylonian Empire, which I didn't list yet only because the Nebuchadnezzar section of it was overthrown by Cyrus, and it had existed, and we know this from the Bible, 74 years. So, um, but if you add up, you take the totality, again, you get close to 250 years. Um, It seems as if they all go through these same phases, That, that, that that first stage of life is a period of incredible initiative, incredible enterprise, courage, ability to face hardship. And, um, and these, these, uh, these behaviors uh, usually produce a brand new and formidable nation. And, um, and, and, and they're achieved by almost reckless bravery and daring initiative. And again, you can think of what happened in the United States of America 244 years ago, roughly, and, and you see that, yes, that, that's kind of what happens. And then what happens when you move on from there, you arrive at um, uh, a period of commercial expansion. And sure enough, by the late 1700s, early 1800s, we've got the Erie Canal being built, which opens up New York and the Midwest. And then soon after that, the middle going towards the middle of the 19th century, the railways, huge wealth creation, right? It's, it's I mean, amazing things happen. And, um, and that usually ushers in, you know, a period of, of building stuff. And uh, sure enough, whether it's bridges or art galleries or skyscrapers and buildings and cities, but what happens is that... Uh, that that the the commercial expansion produces enormous wealth in 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 the society and among those people who practice commerce you know how much i uh, i love the field of business and that is that's commerce so um the uh, the business community looks for ways and it usually finds expression in art and architecture and uh splendid municipal buildings and they build wide streets all of these things happen in in every one of these cultures that moves towards empire greatness and then they they reach a period of incredible affluence where money's just not an issue at all and um and uh and yet the early signs of problems are beginning to loom. All of a sudden, it becomes clear that money is exactly what is causing the decline of a once strong, brave, and self-confident people. 
the, this decline in courage and fortitude and enterprise, a sense of duty and obligation, happens very gradually. And what then happens is uh, the wealth injures the morality of the nation. Money starts replacing honor and adventure as the goal and objective of the best young men. So um, little by little, the, the affluence begins to give way. And you realize then that you have reached the zenith of that society's growth. United States of America, if I wanted to pin the zenith, yeah, probably to 1960, most likely. You know, that's probably the height. And then starting to decline after that, right? Um, from then onwards, a lot of what happens is that influence that used to be spread by military power, uh, in other words, other nations around the world that um, respected this new emerging empire or nation it was usually because of great military prowess. But now, because there's been a decline in honor and duty and obligation, uh, people, yeah, you know, uh, it's, it's not so much the military, and you think the period of the Vietnam War. So now, how does this great nation continue? And by the way, this applies to all nations. This is as true to the story of the British Empire and the Roman Empire, but I'm just personally most familiar with American empire history. And uh, what then happens is they influence the nations around them by money, not by military, not by arms. Foreign aid, uh, sending money, giving them money, uh, building commercial links with them, which is in the interest of the other nations to protect and preserve. And so they respond compliantly. And then what happens and the next thing that's very interesting is um, academics seize power. Up till then, up to, up till now, power was the the leaders who created the new empire, the military people who spread it, the commercial class who brought it affluence. But then it becomes academics and elitists, and this is so true for the Roman Empire and the British Empire. It's incredible. But you'll love the next stage. By the way, we're up to stage eight, right? I, I spoke about this breakout period as stage one, commercial expansion two, great buildings, now three, development of great affluence for the zenith, the, the, the period of just, it looks like things are just going to keep getting better and better. And uh, six is... No longer does the country have military strength. You remember I've, in an pre earlier show I've told you that America has basically not won a war since 1945. So 1960, uh, we didn't, by then we had basically not won a Korean war. We were on the verge of not winning a Vietnam war. And how did America retain influence? Well, uh, stage six is spreading influence by money, not by military and arms. Stage seven is academics begin to be the controllers and the uh, style setters and the power base of society. And, um, and that's what happens. You're going to love number eight. No, you're not going to love number eight, but it's true. Number eight is the influx of foreigners. And uh, it is so fascinating to read about this. Um, when, uh, I mean, Roman historians were very good at recording this. They complain about the number of Asians and Africans in their capital in Rome. Uh, in the ninth century, of course, Baghdad was the capital of its empire, and their historians speak about Baghdad being overrun with Persians and Turks and Armenians and Egyptians and Africans and Greeks. <laughs> it's incredible. And, and you think about London as the British Empire began to fade, you know, uh, mid-1950s. You went through London, and all of a sudden, London had changed. London was now filling up with foreigners, and the British were uncomfortable with it. 
but they, by their academic elites, who by then had power, because academic elites seizing power is number seven, influx of foreigners is the next thing that happens, and the academic elites persuade you that, oh, everything is just fine, nothing to worry about at all. And so um, New York, exactly the same thing, rather amazing. Now, you've got to note that second and third generation immigrants appear outwardly to be entirely assimilated. But um, there are a couple of problems with that. First, their basic nature is usually different from that of the original stock. And so if the earlier imperial race was dogged and hardworking and stubborn and the immigrants might come from more emotional backgrounds and that introduces cracks and schisms into national politics. And then the other thing is that while the nation is still affluent, all the diversity might appear to be, oh, everyone's equally loyal, everyone loves America, loves your country, Persian Empire, British Empire, Roman Empire, everything's good. But as the things begin to deteriorate, the immigrants are often less willing to sacrifice their lives and their property than the original descendants of the founding race. And uh, the last point that I want to make on immigrants is they're liable to form... Again, I'm not talking about United States 2020. I'm talking... Uh, it's true here as well. But my information is derived from Rome, from uh, the Persian Empire, the Roman Empire, the British Empire... Immigrants are liable to form communities of their own, protecting and looking after their own interests. You know, and, and you think of some of the um, women in the United States Congress of immigrant background, and you really wonder now whether they are for America or for their people. Um, President Obama's um, uh, Eric Holder, you might remember, spoke about having to work for our people, and he meant a specific group of people, not the nation as a whole. So that gets to be very, very interesting. Um, in, the, uh, in the Baghdad empire I was just talking about, in their golden days, Arabs were a minority in the imperial capital. Um, Istanbul, during Ottoman rule, was mainly populated by foreigners, people from all around the Ottoman Empire. Very few of the Istanbul people in, in their golden age were descendants of the original Turkish conquerors. Well, this is like saying, look, in New York 2020, how many of the people in New York are descendants of the, of the pilgrims and how many of them are descendants of immigrants? And anybody who looks at that answer knows where about America is on this standard journey, this, this, this decline. So um, you must wait till the end of the show for hope, because it does sound as if I'm saying you may as well settle back. We're six years away from 250 years of American history, for those of you listening in America. And, and so it's, it's all over. We can, we can start kissing goodbye to the American empire. As it turns out, that's not what I'm saying. But at the moment, I'm still showing you how persuasive that case is. Um, you, by the way, you can read today a thousand-year-old histories of Baghdad, thousand-year-old histories where they talk about things, how much they hated the degeneracy of the times. And they spoke about how young people began to be indifferent to religion, uh, the increasing devotion to materialism, and also the decline of sexual morality. Uh, and here's the best part of all. I saw this in a thousand-year-old historical text describing the downfall of their empire. Uh, they lament the corruption of politicians, and they speculate on how can it be that all the politicians seem to amass large fortunes while they're in office. Wow. Um, they speak also about um, singers and musicians exerting extraordinary influence over young people and that this contributes to a decline in morality. Very interesting. 
um, they and he, oh, he, here's the best part, by the way. Whether in Rome or in the other empires I've mentioned, including the British Empire, and I'll leave America for you to figure out for yourself, they all mention a factor towards the end is the increased influence of women in public life. Now, I have spoken on the show before about how you can show that as suffrage was achieved in each American state, this didn't all happen at the same time, you can watch the politics of American states going left as women got the vote. <laughs> yes, I mean, it's, you know what my job here is to tell you the truth. And uh, that's exactly what I'm doing. And so in these history books, they all speak about the influence of women in public life. Uh, in Rome, for instance, they used to say, Rome rules the world but women rule Rome. And they didn't used to say that with approval. Um, they, um, uh, they, they, they ask, you know, what's going on? They, they, what, how's, it, how's this happening? That women all of a sudden are moving into position of powers. Female judges, um, and that really bothered them. So it's very, very fascinating. When I read the descriptions of the closing days of the Roman Empire, and I read this, the historians of Baghdad, honest to goodness, I think I am reading the New York Times or the Washington Post, excepting that the Washington Times and New York Post are not decrying these. They are praising these developments. In, it's as if they are actually wanting to see the end of the American Empire, so it's it's quite amazing and um, and remarkable to watch. So um, then, so we're up to item uh, eight: influx of foreigners. And then what seems to happen? And this has been going on in America, right, for uh, many many years already. So then the next phase, phase nine, is what I call the eat, drink, and be merry phase, where it's just. Um, you know, people uh, people use drugs, they use alcohol. Basically, it's just um, eat, drink, and be merry for who knows what tomorrow will bring because everybody, even subconsciously, are beginning to see the problems, the very real problems on the horizon. And so uh, the next stage after that, well, decadence, which is not a physical problem, it's a moral and spiritual disease. And it produces cynicism, lack of conviction in the value of your own culture, the decline of religion, tremendous pessimism. And, um, and at that point already, it's hard to even find citizens who are willing to save themselves because they are not convinced that anything at all is worth saving and that's really pretty much what happens and that then is what takes us to the end of that society so now uh, you see i'm not leaving us at this i mention this because it's you know you you must surely be aware that things that are happening are no good but where does it all lead? And how much time as your rabbi do I want to devote to all of this? And the answer is not a whole lot because you've all got eyes in your head. You've all got ears to hear. You all have a pretty good idea of what's going on. You all know it's not good news. And um, for me to just go on and on about it, there's no point in that. That's not what I'm here for. I'm here to bring you ancient Jewish wisdom in ways that will help you in your five F's. I'm here to reveal ancient Jewish wisdom that you can use to help your faith, your family, your friendships, even your physical being, and your finances. And that's the important thing to realize that 
ups and downs are perfectly normal in life. And, the, and here's something that I, I'm not going to dwell on for long now, but I'm going to state the fact, and I ask you to dwell on it. I'm going to tell you that there are no fewer financial opportunities now than they were a year ago, or they were five years ago, or they were 10 years ago. Oh, depression, depression, depression. That doesn't mean they're not opportunities. There are opportunities no matter what is going on. And so a very heavy focus on, oh, things are falling apart, the culture's collapsing, the, the economy is collapsing. No, 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 no. Everything continues. Not the same as before. That's for sure, right? No, it's not. things aren't staying exactly the same. However, you still have to build your family. That's not changing. You still have to build your friendships, your relationships. You still have to look after your health. You still have to connect with God, and you have to build your finances. And the opportunities for doing all those things are not less in difficult times. You know, one of the sayings is, an ill wind blows no good, or every cloud has a silver lining. And yes, obviously, many people have gone through severe difficulties and challenges over the last four months, and many are and will continue to. But at the same time, some of the people I've spoken to who have been going through tough times have at the same time said, but my family is so much better than it ever was before. We're not sending our children back to a GIC, government indoctrination camp formerly known as public schools. No, we're not. We've, we've discovered that we like our children as long as they are not being aggressively influenced and shaped and sculpted by the secular fundamentalist culture being promoted at gigs. No, when we are the ones influencing and shaping our children, our family's a lovely place. And so you've got difficulties, but you've also got good things going on. So what I'd like to do now is shift gears to talk about money and some of the ways that you should be thinking in order to make the best of the present time. And, uh, and then when I finish that, I'll wrap up by explaining why I have not given you cause for gloom. Yes, uh, at the moment, the way it looks, the America that the founders created does not look as if it's going to last forever. But whatever gave you the thought that it would what were you thinking of, a thousand-year America? Anybody who knows anything at all about the history of societies and nations and people and empires, it's that you get about 250 years, and then it's somebody else's turn. But that doesn't mean the world comes to an end. But when we finish the next section on money, I'm then going to talk about why it actually may be different for America why there is a possibility of it all coming back again. But it all will depend, well, on you, see? But let's, for now, get on to money. Our human relationship with something called money. And it's worthwhile making sure that not only do we understand it, but that those for whom we are responsible, those whom we either brought into the world biologically or those whom we are bringing into the world spiritually by teaching, by educating, by acculturating them, by essentially making ourselves responsible for teaching them how the world really works. None of that is possible without an understanding of money. And if there's one reality that we can learn from the past few decades, it is that the public perception of anything really does shape real-life outcomes. And uh, one frightening change during this period has been a war on wealth conducted in response to a growing public perception that somehow the rich got that way by stealing from the poor. 
Now, this perception includes the idea that wealth-producing activities are faintly unseemly and that economic activity causes rather than cures poverty. There is a way to restore the prestige of business success that requires a return to tradition. In order to examine it, we have to analyze the nature of money. As we look around us, we cannot help but fail to notice that there are phrases that are used which re reveal how people really think. The most insidious of these is the one you always hear commentators using whenever a well-known philanthropist makes some major gift to a charity. And the phrase is always, how wonderful it is to see him giving back to society. Uh, sometimes it is a uh, donor, him or herself, saying, I just felt it was time for me to give back to society. Well, what's so insidious about that phrase is that if giving charity is giving back to society, what were you doing to society while you were making the money in the first place? Obviously, ripping them off. And that's what's so dangerous about that. The idea that somehow we have to expiate the sin of making money by giving charity. And nothing could be further from the truth. Giving charity? Sure. I think it's a good idea. I think it's worthy on, on many, many different levels. But it is no more incumbent upon people with a huge amount of money than it is upon people with a small amount of money. Everybody should be giving away at least 10% of their income. That's what we should all be doing. It's got absolutely nothing to do with your success or lack of it. Uh, there are other phrases. One of them is unearned income. You know what unearned income is? It's that uh, if you put the capital which you have carefully accumulated through years of work at risk and you sink it into an investment and against odds that pays off the money you get from that is unearned income you don't really deserve that you didn't do anything that is an unbelievably materialistic view of the economy if you weren't digging ditches you didn't earn that money and uh, and so it is. It's you, you know you hear politicians often using the phrase. It was one that the last president was very very uh, fond of. The rich must pay their fair share. Okay, again, a subtle implication that the rich are getting away with something. Who are the rich? Well, that doesn't get defined. As a matter of fact, all the people are wildly applauding. The politician who says, yeah, the rich must give their fair share, will sadly discover all too quickly that they will be next in line to be fed to the crocodiles under the heading of the rich. Okay, let's, let's take a look at the nature of money. Decades before our computer-controlled virtual labs Albert Einstein created his famous thought experiments. They allowed him to solve problems uh, for which actual laboratory experiments would have proven too expensive or too dangerous or just impossible to conduct. For instance, rather than measuring gravity in an elevator dropping down a three-mile elevator shaft, the great scientists showed that just as well, we can do a lot more safely, even by analyzing the situation from the comfort of our own desks. In the social sciences also, we can make excellent use of the idea of a thought experiment. Let us conduct a thought experiment to see if we can understand the origins of our own calendar. The protocol proceeds as follows. 
we deposit a young boy and a young girl on an otherwise deserted tropical island. You can see why this is going to have to be a thought experiment, right? I mean, you just know that those pesky child protective service agencies are going to interfere with the conduct of this experiment. So, confining it to the area of thought, we uh, place them on the island, we take care that they have enough to eat, and we set up some concealed surveillance equipment, and we observe their development. I think we can safely uh, stipulate that they will discover the secret of sex and reproduction. I think we can count on that. After a century or two, I think we can agree that they will have increased their numbers substantially. By now, we are watching a fully-fledged society. However, they remain utterly oblivious of any other human beings or of any human history. They are totally isolated. However, they will probably notice a certain periodicity in the heavens, right? Eventually, they'll develop a calendar. After a few more centuries of experience, they will discover that the solar year contains 365 days. Yeah, I know it's 365 and a quarter roughly, but for the purposes of this thought experiment, let's just go with 365, okay? In the same way, prolonged scrutiny of the skies will eventually yield them a lunar month of, uh, you know, about 30 days. Yeah, I know it's actually 29 days, 12 hours, 44 minutes, 3 and a third seconds, but let's just go with 30 days. However, I'm sure you'll agree that it is highly unlikely in our thought experiment that this isolated society will ever adopt a seven-day week. Not only is there no visible astronomic seven-day cycle, but seven does not divide evenly into either 365 or into 30, which makes it an illogical choice, because it messes up the calendar. This is one of the reasons that you have to buy a new calendar every December the 31st. Whereas if they came up with a different number of days for the time period we think of as a week, why, that would work very well indeed. On our thought experiment, this isolated society would most likely establish a five-day week, because this would make each calendar year a perfect replica of the preceding one. That would be really useful. So why do we have something as confusing and artificial as a seven-day week when switching it to five would make so much sense? Well, there's only one reason, and that's because we retain a primeval collective memory that long ago God initiated a seven-day cycle as a kind of divine circadian rhythm. It's hard otherwise to account for the wide acceptance of the seven-day week. And just as the seven-day week is the result of a collective memory of a religious tradition, so too is money. While our clandestine survey of this remote island nation will reveal the islands, islanders bartering with one another, it's, lot, it's a lot less certain uh, that they'll make the jump of assigning value to disks of metal. In all probability, that would not happen on our island, as indeed it failed to happen in many parts of the real world. In fact, virtually all populations that were isolated from Bible-based religious tradition failed to make the leap from barter to coins and, yes, to capital. Where the Bible served as the earliest source of wisdom, people understood the role of gold and silver. They learned how greatly to expand trade and therefore wealth, by employing precious metals as an exchange medium. They understood the role of private property and the role of law in protecting that property. And naturally, these people enjoyed a gigantic head start over those who had to discover this all by trial 
and error. Let's take a quick break. Uh, the website, rabbidaniellappin.com, where you will find it possible to do an instant download of a wonderful set called the Biblical Blueprint Set. Now, I'll tell you more about it. But meanwhile, if you go to the website, rabbidaniellappin.com, not only will you be able to subscribe to Thought Tools and to Susan's Musings and to the weekly Ask the Rabbi column, and not only would you be able to communicate and send us a, a letter or a question, but you'll be able to read up about the Biblical Blueprint set and how you can download it right now or at the end of the show we're yes. back everybody back a and thank you for being part of the rabbi daniel lappin show by which i mean to say thank you not only for listening but i thank you also for the enormous help you've all been in promoting the show and telling other people about it I avidly watch the download figures on all the various platforms on which the show appears uh, in order to get a sense of our growth. And it's very gratifying, it's exciting, and it, it makes me throw myself into the show with renewed vigor and renewed enthusiasm. So I very much appreciate that. Okay, well, um, we go on and... Um, You'll remember we left our uh, new little society or nation on a remote and isolated island, and um, and we noticed that uh, little by little they understood the role of private property and they understood the role of gold and silver. But the the idea is, or at least what I was trying to say. I'm sorry, I I, I confuse things a little bit. What I was trying to say is that. Uh, on the remote and isolated island, they never did figure out how to move away from bartering. But it was the Bible that served as the earliest source of wisdom. It helped people understand the role of gold and silver and how to expand trade and develop wealth and how to use precious metals as an exchange medium. All of that happened because these people who had connection with the Bible, those nations and societies with the Judeo-Christian connection, enjoyed a huge head start over those who had to discover it all by trial and error. There was another reason why those Western civilizations based on the Bible flourished economically. You see, the individual character traits that Judeo-Christian Bible-based thought promotes are the very qualities that best prepare people for effective roles in commerce. One of the most important of these is the faith habit. Faith accustoms people to the real world, wherein almost every worthwhile venture requires one to make a major commitment with no assurance of success. For example, people marry without the help of a crystal ball that would predict all the ups and downs of their lives ahead. Farmers plant and await crops that may or may not ripen. And of course, investments of capital always involve risk. People buy a house. They have no idea what's going to happen to that neighborhood down the road. You make your best decision, but essentially we act on faith. Well, we know that those people who live lives connected with Judeo-Christian biblical tradition tend to have well-developed faith muscles. That puts them in a better position to function in a free market economy. As a matter of fact, You'd probably agree if I say the very act of accepting metal discs or pieces of colored paper in exchange for a day of backbreaking labor in itself requires enormous faith. To understand the true dimensions of that faith, just think about how things go in the absence of faith. When investors lose faith in markets, when depositors lose faith in banks, when citizens lose faith in the currency, disaster strikes. However, as long as the faith habit is intact, 
people will accept payment for their goods and services. They do so out of faith that when they require some commodity, some vendor somewhere will in turn accept their little metal discs or scraps of colored paper. As long as the future remains uncertain, people who maintain Bible-inspired faith have a huge advantage, whether as spouses or farmers or investors or builders or anything. Judeo-Christian thought nurtures another personality trait, which also serves well those who practice capitalism, and that is deferment of gratification. A religious outlook helps to promote saving rather than impulse spending. It also inculcates in people the idea that there is merit in doing the right thing for its own sake rather than for reward. This also is a valuable mindset for the ambitious entrepreneur who has to focus on filling a need rather than on other people's purses. Everybody wants money. But those who pursue it directly instead of seeking a niche usually fail. The most conspicuous commercial successes are achieved by those who find a way to serve other people or to provide them with the things they want. I do wish that I could solve the the problem of um, phone calls. I mean, I'm just thinking to myself that if this was a live show over a terrestrial radio station, I've got to think that right now the, the lights would be lighting up and uh, there would be calls with people either questioning or elaborating because, you know, I'm, I'm sort of really, I'm, I'm moving quickly. I'm talking about a lot of things uh, because I'm, I'm trying to illustrate, um, you know, what, what, what money really is. But unfortunately... Uh, we don't have, I don't have the capacity at the moment um, to uh, be able to record this show in such a way so as that uh, live calls can come in while people are listening. I, I'm just not quite sure how to do that. Uh, at the same time, I just want to say that people are amazingly responsive. Do you remember a little while ago I mentioned how I keep a um, uh, a rubber band of of three by five index cards with me at night because I sometimes wake up in the night with an idea, particularly if I gave myself the job of working subconsciously on a problem. And I happened to mention on the show that um, a pen with a light in it would be really useful so I don't have to turn on a light because I don't want to disturb Susan Lappin. And so I I write in the dark. And in the morning, there's been more than one occasion. I, I, can't, I can't even begin to decode what I wrote. Well, I mentioned this on the show. And would you believe it? Not one, not two, but three different people from around the country uh, responded helping me solve the problem of pens with lights. Yes, friends, there actually is such a thing, a pen with little lights in it, of which I am now the proud owner. Just wanted to tell you that. Uh, So when I say I appreciate you all listening, and I appreciate all of you who help promote the show, and I appreciate those of you who respond, as as, as so many of you have, uh, I really do. So it's a heartfelt thank you. Um, so, so as I was saying, um, financial success is usually won by people who find a way to give other people the things they need, services or goods. Now, religious teachings that emphasize the virtue of charity thus fit well into business school curricula. Now, they don't really, but they should. Because charity helps to loosen the tight grip that many of us instinctively have on our money. Let me tell you something. No miser ever turned into a great investor. It doesn't happen that way. A miser never becomes an investor. Religion encourages people to give, to open up their hands. It encourages people to raise family 
families, I should say, uh, and families are the very best incubators of entrepreneurs. It's true. They really are. When people who grew up in dysfunctional families, when people who grew up without families um, suffer from poverty, the problem isn't that the government isn't giving them enough money. The problem is they were not raised by a mother and a father dedicated to acculturating them into the real world. It's in a family that the young future business professional learns the value of labor and also about specialization, by the way, from wise and responsible parents. Children learn virtually all the skills necessary for a great first job. It's true. When somebody comes to you for a first job, really all you should be asking them in an interview is tell, tell you about their family. And as you listen to it, if they grew up in a terrific family with great parents, you probably have yourself a terrific employee. And uh, perhaps the last thing I, I want to say in this segment is that religion's emphasis on family helps an economy because very few great commercial enterprises get built in one generation. It is children that fuel a man's ambition to drive himself beyond the needs of his own lifetime. Does that make sense? I hope so. Um, I'll carry on right after the break, but first of all, the uh, the the website, rabbidaniellappin.com. The resource I recommend for your attention is the download of a set of audio programs called the Biblical Blueprint Program. The Biblical Blueprint Program. Um, and in, rather than me uh, tell you all about it, why don't you just go on to rabbidaniellappin.com, go to the store, and read up. You'll see there's a whole description of the Biblical Blueprint program. And uh, if you're looking for something to do in your family, if you want to have a discussion with your children, well, every one of the audio programs in my Biblical Blueprint set would serve as a very valuable thing for you all to listen to together and then pause it at appropriate moments as discussion crops up. I think you'll find it to be extremely valuable in that regard. Okay, I'll be right back. Hello, everybody. And yes, we're back. I, your rabbi, revealing how the world really works. And one of the ways the world really works is that there is not and there has not been any society ever on this planet that has embraced atheism and has also operated a successful free market. Isn't that weird? If you think about it, isn't that odd that no successful economy has ever sprung up from a doctrinal atheistic society? Hasn't. And that this hasn't happened is not a coincidence, but it's an inevitable consequence of the spiritual nature of money. Let me analyze that a little bit further together with you. All human activities can be located somewhere on a spectrum that is anchored at one end by spirituality and at the other by physicality. Now, I just want to emphasize that when I say spiritual or spirituality, please don't for a moment think that that word is synonymous with holy, godly, virtuous. No, 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 no. Spiritual simply means something not measurable by any known laboratory instrument. Okay, so uh, imagine the spectrum line, if you will. At one end, you can put a big label spiritual. And at the other end, you can put a big label physical. And now let's put certain activities in their appropriate place on the line. Great exercise, by the way. If you've if you got uh, bright, curious children, 
and uh, you want to do an exercise like this with them, I think you'll be very gratified both by the experience and the results. Okay, let's put prayer. How about praying? Okay, that's easy, right? We're going to put that near the spiritual end, obviously. How about reading and writing? Yeah, you know what? We're going to have to put them there as well. Composing music. Making tools. Those are all over on the spiritual side of the spectrum. Um, How's about sex? As the source of both great sensual pleasure, obviously, and also the source of all new life, sex might be somewhere near the mid-spectrum, maybe, while eating and going to the bathroom, well, they belong over towards the physical end. Commercial transactions, where do they belong? Well, on the spiritual end. Let me explain. One way of identifying a spiritual act is by determining whether your pet chimpanzee would understand it. Now, I think everybody should have a pet chimpanzee, regardless of what Peter says. I I have one, and you should have one too. And um, obviously, this is also part of the thought experiment, because it is really so much more pleasant to keep an imaginary chimpanzee than a real one. Now, why is it that a chimpanzee can help us determine where on the spiritual physical spectrum line an activity belongs? Well, this is because the good Lord endowed man with his spirit. And so that way he distinguished between a man and a chimpanzee. When I return home from work and slump into a comfortable armchair, my chimpanzee undoubtedly sympathizes. As I move to the dinner table and begin eating, he certainly gets it. When I open a newspaper, however, and hold it motionless in front of my face, the chimp becomes quite confused. This test suggests that a business transaction is more spiritual than physical. A chimpanzee would not have the slightest idea of what is transpiring between proprietor and customer at the counter of a store. Economic exchange takes place only after two thinking, sentient human beings will it. The process is spiritual. Human beings are always slightly uneasy about pursuits that have no spiritual overtones at all. When necessary, we superimpose spirituality precisely to avoid being exclusively physical and thus, well, uncomfortably animal-like. We apply ceremony and ritual to our actions that are also animalistic. Only people read a book or listen to music. That's why those activities require no associated spiritual ritual. On the other hand, all living creatures eat, engage in sexual activity, give birth, and die. Now, if we people do not confer a uniquely human ritual on those functions, we reduce the distinction between ourselves and animals. And therefore, we people, we celebrate the birth of a child often by a naming ceremony. No animal does that. Even if our hands are quite clean, we wash them before eating, rather than afterwards like a cat does. We prefer to serve food in dishes on a tablecloth rather than straight out of the can. Although we have to admit that the physical, nutritional qualities have not in any way been enhanced by a white tablecloth and nice china. We even say a grace or a benediction. How about after encountering an attractive potential sexual partner? People do not proceed directly to physical intimacy like animals, no. 
an engagement announcement followed by a marriage ceremony serves to accentuate that all-important distinction. No animal announces its intention to mate and then defers gratification for three months while it calmly prepares its wedding and its future homes. No, you don't find animals doing that at all. The more physical our activity, the more awkwardness and subconscious embarrassment surrounds it. Nudism. Nudism is practiced with a certain bravado that is so evident it's it's almost embarrassing how deliberate nudists are in pretending to be indifferent to the fact that they're naked. Why? Because they're trying to conceal the underlying tension. Uh, there was a famous photographer, I think he was British, called Richard Avedon. Uh, he shattered a barrier by capturing images of people as they ate. Frozen in the act of chewing... Humans resemble apes rather than angels. Our mothers, who of course were all raised in a Judeo-Christian tradition, taught us never to eat in public. Similarly, we express a normal and very healthy reticence about bathroom activities. On the other hand, as purely spiritual occupations, reading and art evoke no discomfort. Going to the bathroom? Yeah, we camouflage it. We talk about, we don't say what we really are doing. We talk about going to the men's room or we go to the powder room. And when you go there, you find monogram towels and decorated rooms and pieces of soap shaped like seashells. It's as if everything is done to add a spiritual overlay a kind of a ritual to something that we share with animals, so that when we do it, we do it in a very different way. In the same way that reading or praying or, uh, or, or uh, enjoying music develop no discomfort in us, we don't feel that those activities need to be surrounded with ritual. Similarly, buying and selling should evoke no psychic discomfort in us at all. Economic activity is another way in which we satisfyingly distance ourselves from the animal kingdom and justify our humanity. This helps to explain why the most secular elements in American society commonly lead assaults on the free market. Almost inevitable. The assaults that come, come from people who are basically on the atheistic end. It's inevitable. Those who have rejected religion are eager to find other outlets for their moral expression. There is no better way than to exhibit a revulsion for democratic capitalism. Today we hear people referring to the 80s as a period of moral depravity. Being unaware of the spiritual nature of money and of wealth creation, those individuals consider the miracle of economic enterprise to be the human equivalent of dogs fighting over a bone. When we come back, I want to tell you about the the historic clash between socialism and the traditional wisdom of the West. But for now, we'll pause, take a quick break. The website, rabbidaniellappin.com. The download for your edification, education, enjoyment, and delight is called the Biblical Blueprint Set. It's an audio download you can do immediately, instantly, and something that uh, will benefit you and your family. Great, great discussion points in, in almost every few minutes of that program, which was why we created it. The website, rabbidaniellappin.com. But as a regular listener, you already know that. And if you're not a regular listener, well, I welcome you as a newcomer to refer to anything having to do with wealth creation. Uh, If the economy is going up, then the culture tends to 
denigrate the period of economic prosperity as a period of moral depravity. Um, this, by the way, I've, I've gone back and looked all the way back to the late 1960s, and you know I consider the 60s to be a, uh, a bridge point, and uh, almost without uh, exception. Uh, in, those, in, in that period, if you take a look at the times when things have been positive economically, uh, all the way up to the period of uh, 2017 and 2018, uh, significantly up, you will see the culture, uh, meaning news media, um, higher education, entertainment, the loudest voices in shaping cultural opinion uh, dismiss always, oh, it's a bad time, people are bad, Cult it, it's moral depravity, essentially. Uh, in, in the most recent period, as I say, 2017 and 2018, uh, dismissing the period as Trumpism and uh, a period of, of greed and hatred and, and white supremacy, etc., 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 all in an effort to undermine the uh, economic good times, or at least economic improvement. Um, basically, these people look at economic enterprise, transactions between free individuals, voluntary transactions, they translate that as the human equivalent of dogs fighting over a bone. The great historic clash between socialism and the more traditional wisdom of the West is really just a reflection of a, a more fundamental underlying disagreement. This is a disagreement over the origin of mankind. And as I've pointed out before, this is not a question that needs to be debated in churches and divinity schools. It's a question that needs to be settled in corporate boardrooms. It needs to be settled in business schools. Either God created us or we evolved from primeval protein sludge passing through a primate-like phase on the way. No one has yet proposed a realistic third alternative. Those are the only two ways of explaining our presence. Now, if we accept the godless alternative, then indeed we do not differ in kind from monkeys or other animals. We only differ in degree. We are less facile in speed and strength and hearing and sight than some animals, but we think and speak a little better than others. You win some, you lose some. Animals do not create wealth. They merely seize the commodities they need. And people obviously do the same, since we are just a variation of animal. People might employ more sophisticated methods, like bonds, shares, debentures, and other tools of the trade of finance but it is nonetheless nothing but seizing. Clearly, morally sensitive people have to decry this activity. Sure enough, American politics and academia, long dominated by those hostile to a traditional view, echo this approach. Those that most strongly advance evolution as the one and only explanation for our presence on the planet are also those that most aggressively oppose the free market economy. It's unmistakable. But on the other hand, if God did create us and touched us with his abilities, then we are qualitatively different from animals. Our ability to speak and to create is quite unique. Therefore, animals plunder, but people profit. The creation of wealth is an expression of our godly origins. This view of man's origins, well, it helps us to subdue the feelings of guilt often brought on by success. Usually, people with no religious faith who enjoy sudden success, think of Hollywood celebrities, for instance, 
they develop an almost irrational dedication to socialist causes. If ideas do have consequences, and they do, the idea that we are descended from angels rather than ascended from apes has undoubtedly played a role in one of the most magnificent consequences of history, American democratic capitalism. Revealing his own brand of genius in a fantastic poem, it's more of an epic, called Paradise Lost, the English poet John Milton, uh, by the way, who who uh, exercised considerable influence on the pilgrims and, and that group of people who played such a role in the history of the 17th century, um, John Milton, his poem, by the way, Paradise Lost, worth taking a look at, uh, he etched the Bible centrality in our literary consciousness. He, he really did. He reflected everyone's subconscious awareness that the opening chapters of the Bible focus on the eternal tug of war for man's soul between angels and apes. There's this titanic struggle between the, di- between the divine aspirations of a person's nobility along with our basest indulgences. Right? And there's not a person among us that doesn't feel that internal tension. Attention, one as one part of it pulling us upwards, and another part of it holding us down. Whom would Adam obey? God or the serpent personification of the animal kingdom? Well, after thousands of years of human history, the lingering memory of that struggle still resonates in our souls. All heirs to the Judeo Christian tradition feel the need to distinguish ourselves from animals and to unequivocally demonstrate who it was who won that primeval conflict. Seizing another's property by force is animalistic and a victory for the serpent, but purchasing it voluntarily for the price set by the seller finds favor in God's eyes. A store or a market is one of the few places in which strangers interact voluntarily, leaving each party happier than he was before. No wonder, then, that God smiles upon the marketplace. Freedom from tyranny is a necessary precondition for both worship and trade. It's therefore... (laughs) It's not surprising, is it, that economics used to be a field of study that belonged with religion and theology. Adam Smith, as well as many other 18th century economists, were religious philosophers before they were economists. Adam Smith, for instance, wrote a book called Theory of Moral Sentiments before he ever wrote Wealth of Nations. That was published same time as Our Nation formed, 1776. When the great universities moved the study of economics from their religious departments where they used to be to their science departments, they were actually driving a wedge between capitalism and the moral arguments and spiritual dimensions that underpin its very validity. After all, whether a man dissipates his money frivolously or he invests it wisely and whether or not he will bend rules to earn it, depend mostly on his character and on his moral makeup. No wonder that the science that seeks to predict these things, namely economics, is known as the, that's right, the dismal science. Money is spiritual, and how men and women relate to it depends mostly on the state of their soul. Faith is the fuel that drives both commerce and religion. Establishing that a close relationship exists between God and the marketplace helps us in three crucial areas. Firstly, it helps to explain why atheism and business are not natural allies. Wouldn't you have supposed that a philosophy of secular fundamentalism, recognizing no authority, no morality, sanctioning all behavior, would be naturally drawn to the world of money and power? one would have expected the political left 
to excuse what it calls the greed of capitalism and to recognize it as nothing other than Darwinian law applied to the life of modern people. But this is not possible. Something as truly spiritual as business and commercial interaction simply cannot coexist with socialism. The atheist himself recognizes that to be true to his credo, he must first reject the free market because of its godliness. The second thing that a close relationship between God and the marketplace helps us with is that it helps us integrate our careers into our lives instead of regarding those daily eight or ten hours at which we work as a distasteful and isolated part of life. Business is business cannot serve as a convenient explanation for moral departures in the marketplace because business is really tied to life by overall spiritual awareness. Immorality in business should be as repugnant as immorality in marriage. Finally, the third area in which understanding this link between God and the marketplace, the third area that helps us is that when we recognize this, what I call the congruence between work and spiritual reality, the business professional, man or woman, is all the better able to sell him or herself and their product. The work is creative and therefore a legitimate way of emulating God and his infinite creativity. Anyone with a sneaking conviction that socialism has a point and that man and his abilities are limited, as is the economic pie, and that he who brings that pie to market and slices it for customers is exploiting both the baker and the public, well, that person is forever handicapped as a businessman, never going to make much money. Nobody ever throws himself wholeheartedly into an endeavor that secretly in his heart he considers to be demeaning and unworthy. The difference between the animal instinct of a squirrel gathering nuts and the inherent nobility of a human being earning a living, well, that becomes clear when you take a look at economic enterprise in its correct position at the spiritual end of that spectrum I was telling you about. Failure to grasp the interdependency between a people's morality and the health of their economy Well, that comes with a high cost. People often lose sight of how a socialistic government and its confiscatory tax policies will force increasingly desperate citizens to become petty felons as they struggle in futility to preserve the fruit of their labors. As people inevitably begin to cut corners, they lose some of their moral self-esteem, thereby lowering the trigger threshold of the internal moral alarm. This has a corrosive effect that ripples out to every corner of the population. I think Americans are just beginning to sense that many of the social pathologies that have made life more dangerous and expensive and squalid since the nineteen early 1960s have their roots in the uprooting of religion from public life. We should also realize that the furious fever of secularization that has wreaked havoc on our public schools, our universities, and our families has not left our economy immune, right? It doesn't require a very elaborate thought experiment to demonstrate how much our economy would be boosted by restoring a traditional view of money. We need only contemplate why so many people glorify art and music and why they treat galleries and concert halls with an almost religious fervor. They do so out of a deep human need to devote at least part of their existence to activities which they feel uplift them. Art and music elevate because they are God-given and therefore unique to human beings. America's wealth-producing institutions, namely businesses, 
um, ought to arouse the same feelings of respect and awe for precisely the same reasons. Do you see what I'm saying? Art and music, you know, everybody loves supporting the arts. But you should be just as enthusiastic about supporting business. Because when we join the frantic rush to abandon every vestige of our religious tradition, then any free market enthusiast has unwittingly contributed to the sabotaging of our own prosperity. A little thought experiment shows that once our business infrastructure would enjoy similar social esteem to that of the art establishment, which, by the way, it very generously underwrites, there will be at least one very valuable outcome. Politicians will tremble in fear before venturing an assault on the fountainhead of prosperity that for so long has been American business. It was in 1925 that Calvin Coolidge said the following. It's, it often gets misquoted and taken out of context, but he, what he said was, after all, the chief business of the American people is business. They are profoundly concerned with producing, buying, selling, investing, and prospering in the world. I am strongly of the opinion that the great majority of people will always find these the moving impulses of our life. That is quite right, and I've often said I would much rather a person is trying to improve his own financial situation than that he engages in politics. Because if he engages in politics, his hands are going straight into my wallet and he is doing everything he can to increase his power over my life. When we speak about the business of the American people being business, Business really just means the private sector. It means each and every one of us finding ways to effectively serve our fellow citizens and our fellow human beings. And the money that flows is one of the great secrets of the spirituality of money. And understanding the spirituality of money and using that understanding along with the principles that I've been talking about and the principles you can study more about in my books and in my audio programs and in my financial prosperity collection. Building on these principles is really about the best thing you can be doing. It's taking care of one of your five F's. And at the same time, you're looking after your relationship with God, your faith. You're looking after your finances. And you're looking after your uh, families, and you're looking after your friendships. And it is with all of those things that you're in the best position to actually be able to restore America, to help bring America back. What do I mean, and why am I not completely gloomy and pessimistic? I'll tell you why. Look, how long is a human generation? So most people say that a generation, although it's not actually a defined number of years, it's about 25 years. That's what people say, right? Because, uh, well, you can figure out yourself, right? Because by 25, it's, it's fairly typical. And, uh, and, and this has been true, by the way, in all the empires I spoke about. By 25, um, men are usually fathers. And by 50... Well, they're coming, they either are grandfathers or close to being grandfathers, um, as, as humans should live. I know that marriage is being postponed beyond all reasonable levels today, but it's, it's not a wise move. And uh, a lot of these people who are postponing marriage into their mid or late 30s or even later, uh, unfortunately, will regret it when it's too late to do anything about it. But um, 25 years, yeah, about a generation. Now, do a little bit of arithmetic with me here. If 25 years is about a generation, and the average time that empires survive for is 250 years, then that comes out to be about 10 generations. Now, if you happen to have any interest in the Bible, 
you surely cannot he hear me talk about ten generations without immediately thinking about Genesis chapter 5 or Genesis chapter 11 or both. And I'll tell you why. Because in Genesis chapter 5, they list ten generations from Adam to Noah. And that's exactly what happens. Adam, Enosh, Canaan is number uh, four. Uh, excuse me, Adam, Seth is number two, Enosh number three, Canaan, Mahalalel, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, uh, Lemech is number nine, and then Noah is number ten, and you've got a listing, and then sure enough, that also seems to be the end of an epoch, doesn't it? Because then there's a flood, and it all starts all over again, and what happens in chapter 11? We count another ten generations. We count Noah, who's number ten, Enosh is 11, Canaan is, is uh, excuse me, uh, pardon me, um, Shem, Ham, and Japheth are the 11th generation, and uh, Arpachshad is number 12, and Shela is 13, and then comes Aver, and Peleg, and Reu, and Srug, and then comes Nahor is number 18, Terach number 19, guess who's number 20, another 10 generations, Abraham. So again, we get this pattern in the Bible of 10 generations being about the period. So it's not a case necessarily of exactly how many years, but it's about 10 generations. And that begins to be very interesting. And here's the best part of it. And I'm, I'm not going to do this in depth because I've started a new series, which I'm going to make available to those of you who are interested, which is essentially verse by verse through the Bible. And uh, I've started this, and I'm now up to, I think I'm almost up to the sixth day of creation. I'm still in chapter one, um, and you will be able to get access to these, and I'll do this in considerably more detail there. But for now, here is the great thing. You might have wondered, you know, why did I decide that the ten uh, stages of a culture, society, nation, empire, is, you know, the breakout and then the commercial expansion and then building and, and growing and then affluence and commerce and then the zenith is number five and then spreading influence through money, no, no longer through military power, um, the, the growing power of intellectuals and academics, uh, people who talk instead of people who do. Huge distinction, by the way. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it is with some dismay that I confess to my membership in the latter class, but not entirely. I mean, the fact is, I, I do know how to weld, and I have repaired cars in my time, and I can sail a sailboat single-handedly. So I, I reassure myself that I'm not really uh, a clueless academic or intellectual who wouldn't know which end of a nail gun to point at the work. So, uh, no, I, I'm, I'm, yeah, no, I know what a compressor is. Don't worry. I, I, I heard some of you muttering to yourselves. Um, and then the influx of foreigners, and then eat, drink, and be merry, and then internal political fracture is number 10. So we, why did I take these? Because you might wonder why exactly those 10 people named in Genesis chapter 5, the journey from Adam to Noah. And the answer is because each of those names mean something in Hebrew. <laughs> Are you getting the idea? That's right. That's what they mean. And then we find in chapter 11, another 10 generations, a new epoch, a new empire, if you like, ending with Abraham. And sure enough, 10 people mentioned. Again, their names mean something. And it is through the Hebrew meaning of those names. Again, I'll explain this in much greater detail in my Bible study program. But uh, for now, that's where it comes from. And so why am I optimistic? After all, this biblical pattern says, hey, when you put a lot of people together and they form a society, whether it's a little nation on an island or a big nation on a continent, it's going to go through absolutely predictable um, epochs. It's almost prophetic, but you can predict what large numbers of people are going to do, and this is how we do it, and here are the... So why am I, am I not gloomy? This certainly seems to say that this is the end. Well, you see, this is why I'm not gloomy. There is one exception. 
to the story. Remember I said that uh, a Roman official could have traveled from England to uh, Syria or Egypt and never gone outside the Roman Empire on the way. So he's, he, everyone would have been talking the same language. Everyone would have recognized his papers, his authority. He would have used the same currency. That's what it means. Well, in the same way that you have an empire in space, you have an empire in time as well. And there really is only one group of people on the planet today who can talk and read and are comfortable in exactly the same culture that was prevalent 3,000 years ago. And that's the Hebrews. That is the little group of people of whom I am privileged to be a part. That's right. This is absolutely true. All right. Uh, My son, when he was seven years old, could read the book of Jeremiah, written thousands of years ago, and understand what it means, right? A, a, a little five-year-old uh, Jewish boy can read the Torah, 3,300 years old plus. Nothing's changed. The language that his great-grandfather might have spoken in uh, Lithuania or in Russia or in uh, Baghdad or in Egypt their main language would have been Hebrew, and nothing has changed. Yes, of course, in Israel they've come up with words for jet fighter and television, but the basics of the language are still the language of the Old Testament. There is nobody in Greece today, let me put it this way, there are no little boys in Greece today who are absolutely fluent in modern Greece, but can read the works of Homer. Not possible. The Iliad is a closed book. The Odyssey, impenetrable. Different language. China, many people understand Mandarin, but that doesn't mean they can read material from an earlier dynasty because everything changed. And so it is. There is only one group that has persisted for thousands of years. Only one group, the Hebrews. And uh, here they are. Now, I will tell you that this bothered many historians uh, have written on exactly what I've been talking about. They have a slightly different approach, but um, people like Arnold Toynbee used to hate Jews for only one reason, and that is they violated his basic rules of history. And the rules of history are that nations come and they go. And he was highly irritated that Jews didn't have the decency to fade away off the stage of world history, just like the Canaanites, Jebusites, Hittites did. Or for that matter, the Sumerians or the Babylonians. And um, he used to get very, very irritated about that. But it's a fact. The Hebrews are still here. Like them or hate them, love them or despise them, admire them or loathe them. It doesn't make any difference. They're still here. Or I should say we're still here. Now, that's very important because what it means is that if any other nation would adopt some of the principles of Hebrew civilization or the Hebrew empire, if you like, it's not an empire in space, but it is an empire in time then uh, they too will benefit from the same longevity. See where I'm going here? That's right. America was founded on these principles of Old Testament Christianity. That's what they based the country on. And until the 1950s, almost until its zenith in 1960, it remained that way. The commitment to Judeo-Christian Bible-based principles is what built America. Now, again, I know that for many of you, that statement would be very provocative and you'd want me to prove it. And it would be part of another show, another discussion to prove that it's not hard to do. It just takes a bit of time. And I, and that's precisely what I don't have right now, because we've got to bring this all in for a landing. And so, um, Uh, The Hebrew civilization has not gone through these 10 phases, affluence reaching its zenith, number six, spreading influence by money, not military. We never did any of those things. Academics taking control, never true, never true. Uh, The priests were doers in the temple, 
it, it pure academics taking control never happened uh, influx of foreigners no not at all never happened in, in fact it's discouraged all right so the hebrews seem to be immune to this pattern of decline decadence decay and oblivion and to whatever extent a nation adopts these principles they too will acquire some of that durability. And that, my friends, is why I live in hope. You see, America has had two great religious awakenings which turned the world around. The first one was the American Revolution, where instead of rejecting the biblical values that had shaped England up to that point, they strengthened those values. It was a remarkable revolution, and it was fueled by the passion of pastors on the pulpits of colonial churches. And then it came years later. In the middle of the 19th century, the abolition movement was fueled by another great religious awakening. That's right. The abolition of slavery was driven by the churches and by Christianity in America. Right? That's unarguable, please. If a religious reawakening can cause the war of independence and create a nation, and a religious reawakening can abolish a practice that had existed for thousands of years of human history and that was prevalent in almost every part of the world, and it was a religious reawakening, both in the United Kingdom, in England, and in America, that brought about an end to slavery, then, my friends, it is a religious reawakening that can turn America back from the precipice. It's a religious reawakening that can return us, as a nation, back to durability. But it can only come about by a serious return to faith. And I hope that helps many of you, if not all of you, understand that this requires your involvement in a church community. Now, if you're Jewish, and many, many, many of the listeners are, then obviously replace the word church with the word synagogue, right? But I'm talking not about theologies, and I'm talking not about synagogue services. I'm talking about the power of faith to reshape and re-sculpt a culture. And that can only be done when we're together with one another. And that can only be done with an increase in influence. And that comes about through money. And that's why I stress how important it is for you to use these biblical principles that I teach, the biblical principles of finance and prosperity, to make sure that you will be listened to. Because after all, when people are broke... Not a lot of people listen to them. But when those people are affluent, everybody wants to listen to what they have to say. And that's why in the Bible, in the Hebrew Bible, it actually says, wealth is a crown upon the head of the wise. People notice your crown. They don't necessarily know you're wise. But when you've got that crown, when you've got those few dollars in the bank, enabling you to walk tall and speak loudly and clearly, then people notice and people listen. And your ability to influence grows enormously. And that's why I interspersed in the middle of today's show a whole section about where money fits in to all of this. So my friends, please go to RabbiDanielLappin.com. Be in touch with me. I want to hear from you. If you've got comments on today's podcast, I'd love to hear them. And you just go to the uh, part of the website at rabbidaniellappin.com where it says about us. And then in the drop down about us, you'll see contact us. I'll, I'll read what you write. I really will. No question about it. And I'll even respond to a good number of you, although it can take a bit of time. So there it is. Without any question at all, rabbidaniellappin.com is where you should go. Head over to the store, because if you haven't already done so, now is a really good time to equip yourself with the material on biblical finance 
that will totally change the way you behave, not just the way you think, it'll change the way you behave. And only by behaving differently tomorrow can you make sure that it becomes different from yesterday. And that's what it's all about. You will see the financial prosperity collection. If you like learning by video, then that's a good way to go. You will find the audio programs of Prosperity Power Connect for Success and Boost Your Income. You will find the very important books, Business Secrets from the Bible, 40 Spiritual Strategies for Financial Abundance, you will find the book, The Ten Commandments for Making Money, called Thou Shall Prosper. And if you haven't already committed yourself to a personal improvement program in the F of finance, and I know you're working at the same time on faith, you're working at the same time on fitness, you're working on the same time at the same time on friendships and on family, but now is also a time to make sure that you are taking advantage of the opportunities that exist at the present moment, as surprising as they are, because a lot of people are just hunkered down in dismay. They are becoming supine and languid and passive. Now is the time to act. And that material at RabbiDanielLappin.com at the store provides you with a roadmap to restructure your lifestyle in every way imaginable. I want to hear from you. I want to hear that you're doing it. And I want to hear you're making progress. I want to hear you are not a tennis ball floating down the gutter of life. And that indeed, by the time we are together next week, you will have taken concrete steps to make yourself more influential and to join up with other like-minded people of faith Find yourself a good church. There are so many of them around. I've been at so many. Find yourself a good pastor, a brave pastor, a pastor with deep reserves of courage. And um, go for it. Change everything. So that by the time we're together, a week from now, you're able to listen to my voice and say, I did it. I really did. And so I wish you a week of very good times with your finances. And yes, with your faith, because that is what will bring everything back. And your family and your friendships, absolutely all of that. And heaven knows you need your health, so make sure you focus on your fitness as well. I'm Rabbi Daniel Lappin. God bless.